evening. As we, there we go. Good evening. <laughs> I welcome you to worship this Monday, Thursday, this final mandate from Christ to love as he loves. And as we gather and are nourished by our God for these next three days, for these three holy days in this holy week, as we walk beside our Savior in his great love for us. As we begin worship tonight, we remember those people that we are carrying in our prayers into these holy days. We're praying for those who are struggling with their health, for Kathy Akins and Mary Jo Bourbon, for those who are recovering from injury and surgery, um, like Marlene Prill and Dean Sylvester and Alice Niebergs. We are praying for all those who are lonely and who feel forgotten. And we are praying for those who have walked through the shadow of death especially for Kathy Sharp's family, as Greg has suddenly passed, for the Saxum, the Sanderson, and the Nystrom families, for Luann on the death of her family, and for Claude and Renee Gilmer, as Claude has just gone on hospice. We carry these people with us in hope of Christ's resurrection and this love that is poured out for us in Christ on the cross. Friends in Christ, in this Lenten season, we've heard our Lord's call to struggle against sin and death, and to move forward from all that keeps us from loving God and from loving one another, the struggle to which we were called in our baptism. Within the community of the church, God never wearies of forgiving our sin and giving us peace of reconciliation. On this night, we confess our sin against God and neighbor, and we enter the celebration of these great three days reconciled to God and to one another. If you're able, I invite you to stand as we bring our confession before God. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin, and has made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. We enter this day at peace with God, and because of that, we can be at peace with one another in this community. So I invite you to share a sign of God's peace among us as we gather in worship. We join together in singing our opening song, The Three Holy Days Enfold Us Now.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us join together in our prayer of the day. Eternal God, in the sharing of a meal, your Son established a new covenant for all people, and in the washing of feet, he showed us the dignity of service. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, these signs of our life in faith may speak again to our hearts, feed our spirits, and refresh our bodies through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. This time I invite you to be seated. And any children would like to come up for children's message are welcome to do so. Come on up. Good evening, guys. How you doing? Good? Do you remember this day a year ago? You don't? Oh. <gasps> That's okay, I don't either. This day a year ago was your guys' first communion. Oh yeah, this was the night. And we had sat and we had talked about who God is and what God does. And how God comes to us in bread and in wine. Or for you guys, in juice. And sometimes goldfish crackers, because those wafers aren't the tastiest, are they? Do you think anything has changed in the last year? No, nothing at all? Maybe you're like a couple inches taller. Yeah? Maybe you're a little bit smarter? I mean, you've been going to school for like a year now. Come on. You think you're a little smarter? Yeah? How did you get those things? By God? Like you got taller because what happened? No, you ate food. This is really simple. This is really simple. You get taller and you grow because you eat and, and drink water, good, and um, sleep, taking care of your body that way, getting exercise, all those things is what helps you grow. Do you think that it all happened overnight? Did it all happen overnight, mom and dad? <laughs> it's a little bit at a time, isn't it? You don't just all of a sudden get your adult body in like five minutes. It takes a couple of years and it's kind of annoying, guys. It's little bits at a time. Did you know that our faith is a lot like that? That you might not remember who you were a year ago or how your faith has grown, but it has. Just a little bit. Because God keeps coming to you. God keeps showing up. And we have communion every single Sunday. It's a reminder of God with us in every moment. And the more that we think about that, the, the more our trust in God grows just a little bit. Just a little bit. Just a little bit at a time. The more that we think about God and turn our hearts to God, the more that faith and our trust grows. It doesn't always happen at once. It takes a little bit of work sometimes but it's in just living, eating, and drinking, and sleeping, and talking to God, that our faith grows a little bit. And Jesus' disciples had been with him for three years. Do you have any friends that you've been friends with for three years? Do you know them pretty good? You're pretty good friends? You can kind of bug each other a little bit sometimes, but you're still friends, right? I think the same thing happened to Jesus and his friends. And they, over that time, have grown really close. And Jesus wants to give them something that they know even when they can't see Jesus, that he's still there. The same is for communion for us. That little flat piece of wafer, that little tiny cup, is the promise that Jesus is still with us. Even when we can't see him, we have something to taste and touch and hold and know. I swear I'm not moving. <laughs> something to taste and touch and know that God is with us. So when you come forward for communion today, a whole year after you've come, from last year. Think about the ways that God is still working, that God is still meeting you 
and helping your faith and your trust grow, even just a little bit at a time. You ready to pray with me? Dear God, thank you for your love that never quits, that never goes away, and only grows. Help me trust you even when I can't see you because that love is always there. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Oh, I held it longer. (laughs) Thank you, guys. You can go back and have a seat. We now hear from the word of our God. Good evening, church family. Our first reading today is from the book of Exodus, from chapter 2. Israel remembered its deliverance from slavery in Egypt by celebrating the festival of Passover. The festival featured the Passover lamb, whose blood was used as a sign to protect God's people from the threat of death. The early church described the Lord's Supper using imagery from the Passover, especially in portraying Jesus as the lamb who delivers God's people from sin and death. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month, they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join the closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night. And I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. And all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no place shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. The word of the Lord. Please join me in the reading of Psalm 116. I love the Lord who has heard my voice and listened to my supplications. The Lord has given ear to me whenever I call. How should I repay the Lord for all the good things God has done for me? I will 
your cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all God's people. Right, the Lord is the death of your servants. O oh Lord, truly I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your handmaid. You have freed me from my bonds. We offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all God's people. The courts of the Lord's house in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. This ends the reading of the psalm. Now, oh, here I am. Sorry. Too many papers. Our second reading will be from the books of 1 Corinthians, beginning in the 11th chapter. In the bread and cup of the Lord's Supper, we experience intimate fellowship with Christ and with one another because it involves his body given for us and the new covenant of his blood. Faithful participation in this meal is a living proclamation of Christ's death until he comes in the future. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The word of the Lord. Our gospel reading this evening comes from the 13th chapter of John. The story of the Last Supper in John's gospel recalls a remarkable event, not mentioned elsewhere, where Jesus performs the duty of a slave, washing the feet of his disciples and urging them to do the same for one another. I invite you to remain seated for the gospel reading. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come, to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it in the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know what I am doing, but later you will understand. And Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. And for this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe and had returned to the table, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. 
When Judas had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to Christ. Jesus is half-dressed, wrapped in a towel, kneels before his disciples and is rinsing and scrubbing and drying their dirty, dusty feet from the sandals that they wear in and out every day. And I imagine the room is silent. Never before have they seen a Lord and teacher kneeling before his students. Never before has someone switched their station so much that they take the job of a lowly scrubbery maid, a servant girl, as Jesus kneels before them wrapped in a towel. None of them have any idea what is happening in that moment. And then Jesus gets to Peter, and the silence is broken. You're not going to wash my feet. I don't know if he's got a fetish or if he just knew it's been a long time. Never will you wash my feet. And Jesus names the nonsense. You do not know what I am doing for you now, but later you will understand. I need to wash your feet. And Peter says, never seems like such an odd exchange in this story. Like this is so very mundane and simple that why does John give us all these details about Peter arguing with Jesus about washing feet? And I hear in this a bit more of a greater washing. That Jesus isn't just talking about the dirt that's on Peter's feet. There's something more happening in this exchange. I hear the greater washing of our baptism. We've been talking about baptism and little parts of our, of our baptisms and how we do that on Sunday mornings all through the season of Lent. From the renunciations of turning away from sin and the power of evil and all that would defy God. And confessing our faith and our trust in God alone, in what God has done in the past through creation, through Christ and what God is doing in us now and into the future of the spirit that knits us into a community, that applies the forgiveness of sins to us, that promises and renews our own resurrection on our own last day, the spirit that is beside us to build us into the holy, Catholic, universal church. And then we've talked about baptism as just water, and how necessary that is for life, and just how necessary that is for faith, and how baptism has been the thing that opens our eyes to God's Spirit. As we're anointed with the sign of the cross, with oil on our foreheads, told you have been marked with the cross of Christ, sealed by the Holy Spirit forever. And even the imagery of our own death and our own rising into the waters. I think this conversation that Jesus has with Peter is about baptism. And we have a full picture of what it looks like. Peter refuses. You will not wash my feet. And Jesus says, unless I wash you, you will have no part of me. Well, then Peter's all in. Okay, hands, head, feet, do it all. I have to be part of you. And then Jesus says, somebody that's been washed doesn't need to wash everything. It's just the feet that are dirty. See, I hear in this that Peter's already got a share of Christ. That in the three years that they've been together, Christ has made promises and bound together with his disciples. 
they are sharing in exactly the salvation that God is promising, walking side by side with God in God's light and God's love. And I hear an affirmation that everything that Peter has done in those three years has not ruined a thing. In all the times that he blurts out, in all the times when he speaks out of turn, like at the transfiguration in the mountain, oh God, it's good to be here. Let's build some tents and hang out for a while. Peter's big step of faith onto the stormy sea, and then his doubt that makes him sink. Peter, in the next moments in our story, is going to deny Jesus, and not a single one of those things will separate him from the promise Jesus has made. He's been washed. He belongs to Christ. And there is nothing that will happen that will turn him away. But our feet do get dirty, don't they? The places that we go, the ways that we walk that path sometimes end up in places far from Christ, far from what God would hope for us. And our feet end up a little messy. His hands, his head, his self has been washed. But he needs a little attention. And he needs to be renewed in the promise of baptism. And so Peter ends up with his sandals off and his feet washed. And we do the same. We come on a Sunday, we come this evening, and we begin with being honest about where we've been and the dirt that we find on our feet. And instead of hearing the things that we tell ourselves, we'll never get better, this is all we've got, why can't I ever get anything right? We hear instead a different message of you're clean, you're loved, you are forgiven. We hear the same thing in our communion as we take this cup of the new covenant for the forgiveness of sins. These are small washings that remind us of the love that God has already poured into us. The love that embraces us when we are good and when we walk a path that leaves us a mess. And then like the disciples were commissioned, a new commandment is given. The final mandate, the last thing he wants his disciples to remember, to love as Jesus loved them. That's how they are known as disciples. The love they have for one another, the love they have for others in the community, that they too, instead of heaping on guilt for where dirty feet have walked, offer forgiveness. They are to go and offer mercy and love the same way Christ has. And we're about to see what that love does. The love that will not protect itself. The love that does not retaliate when something rises against it. Love that will not lash out or run away from pain. Love that will take on all of the hate that humanity has to throw at it. And who will die with it and rise anew. That will take all that we have to give, all the dirt we can throw on it, and offer us back instead forgiveness and mercy. You have been washed. You have a share of Christ. And Christ will take all of the dirt out of love for you. Amen. Join together in our song of the day.
Let us confess together our faith and our trust in who God is and who God will be. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Sustained by God's abundant mercy, let us pray for the church, for the world, and for all of creation. Almighty God, you make a new covenant with your people. Gather your church around the world and bring them to the word and table in love and promise as these three holy days enfold us. Open us to behold the mystery of our salvation. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Give us our daily bread, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. Bless those who labor and tend their crops, those who prepare our meals. Strengthen us to advocate for food justice and fair distribution of resources. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You, our Savior and teacher, stoop down to us and serve us in love. Inspire national and local leaders with a renewed sense of public service, that they stand there not for ego or for their own advancement, but to bring us together with equity and fairness. Teach us to pray for our enemies. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You incline your ear to hear us in every need. Be with all those who are lonely. Comfort those who are grieving, those who stand in the shadow of death. Soothe any who are anxious. Comfort all who are distressed. Graciously tend to the hurts of your children who suffer in their body, their mind, and their spirit, especially those that we name before you now who are heavy on our hearts this night. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Precious in your sight is the death of your holy ones. We remember and give thanks for those who have died, and with them we trust your promise that you love your own until the end. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your steadfast love and your promise to renew the whole creation through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. On this night, we bring our gifts to God, an offering of love and care for this community and for the work God is doing in this place.
together in our offering prayer. God of good gifts, receive these and all our offerings as we present them in faithful service for the sake of your gospel. Prepare our hearts to receive you in this meal as you pour out your very presence through Christ Jesus, the wellspring of eternal life. Amen. This evening we join in the Eucharistic prayer, a reminder of God's presence in Christ in the night when he was betrayed. You are indeed holy, almighty, and merciful God. You are most holy, and great is the majesty of your glory. You so love the world that you gave your only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world, to fulfill for us your holy will, and to accomplish all things for our salvation. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. Remembering, therefore, his final command, his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again, we give thanks to you, O Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. We ask you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving and with your word and Holy Spirit to bless us, your servants, and these your gifts of bread and wine, so that we and all who share in the body and blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace, and receiving the forgiveness of sin may be formed to live as your holy people and to be given our inheritance with all your saints. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in your holy church, now and forever. Amen. We will be serving communion by table, which means you'll be um, brought forward by our ushers and stand ahead of that black line. Um, Nori and I will be bringing communion to you. So you will stand there, receive, and then eat and wait. I will um, dismiss you each as a group. And at that point is when you will bring your cups to the baskets. Please, come. For all, God invites all to his table.
together in our communion prayer. Lord Jesus, in a wonderful sacrament, you strengthen us with the saving power of your suffering, death, and resurrection. May this sacrament of your body and blood so work in us that the fruits of your redemption will show in the way we live. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. May Almighty God guide you in these days as we reflect and remember the gift of Christ's life given for us for the salvation of our souls and the joy of our lives now. May this body and blood draw you close to God and remind you of God's presence with you in every place that you go. Amen. At this time, those who had been uh, cornered by Kevin, (laughs) I invite you to come forward if you are going to be part of stripping the altar. At this point, worship moves from Monday, Thursday into Good Friday. There is no dismissal. There is no final part. I invite you to sit here, and Ernie, I think you're the first. If you'd like to hold on to that piece of paper, whoever's next, we're going to go down the line and take our time. So we are preparing our sanctuary for the story of Christ's death for us, removing all of the distractions and all of the things that bring us so much meaning, the same way that Christ was stripped. At the, in the process, we'll be hearing the words of Psalm 22, a psalm of being forgotten. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our ancestors trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried, and were saved. In you they trusted, And we're not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a human. Scorned by others and despised by the people. All who see me mock at me. They make mouths at me. They shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord. Let him deliver. Let him rescue the one in whom he delights. Yet it was you who took me from the womb. You kept me safe on my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth, and since my mother bore me, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls encircle me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a raven and roaring lion. I'm poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My mouth is dried up like a broken pot, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs are all around me. A company of evildoers encircles me. My hands and my feet have shriveled. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far away. O oh, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. 
from the horns of the wild oxen. You have rescued me. I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and return to the Lord, and all the families of the nation shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it.